The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. It's been said many times, the world needs more Canada. According to a new book by writer John Stackhouse, millions of Canadian expats around the globe are delivering on that. He joins us to explain why they are a valuable resource for this country. Then we'll hear directly from some Canadians living abroad on how they see it and what being Canadian means to them today. It's Tuesday, October 27th. I'm Nam Kiwanuka and that's tonight on The Agenda. About 3 million Canadians live and work in other countries. And even though they're abroad for their own reasons, writer John Stackhouse argues in his latest book that Canada would do well to make better use of them. The book is called Planet Canada, How Our Expats Are Shaping the Future. He certainly knows the file. He worked overseas as a foreign correspondent, and he was editor-in-chief of the Global Mail. He's currently your senior vice president with the Royal Bank of Canada, and he joins us now from Toronto for more. Hi, John. Hi. I learned so much about Canada reading this book, and I learned about how many Canadians are at the forefront of international organizations throughout the world. Um, you know, and you've written a book with many examples of Canadians who have moved abroad and been very successful. Who are some of the people who left a lasting impression on you? Well, uh, first of all, I'm glad you've, you've mentioned institutions because not a lot of Canadians appreciate that Stanford, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and Cambridge, three of the world's best universities are run by Canadians. Uh, that's just a small illustration of what Canadians are doing uh, on the global stage. But the, the most interesting Canadians I met in the journey through this book are probably people you've never heard of. Uh, one, one is Rafer Wallace, who is one of China's pioneering green architects. Rafer grew up in Quebec, studied architecture at McGill, and then around the turn of the century, in the, in the early 2000s, he wanted to go to where the world was booming and Shanghai was his destination. Almost 20 years later, he's a resident there. His kids were born there. He's, he's raising them there, but he's so deeply Canadian. And I share the Rafer Wallace story because he's an illustration of what we're missing as a country. He was one of China's first green architects, builds uh, buildings that are environmentally friendly, and you, you, you know how, how fast buildings are going up in China. A lot of them are very harmful environmentally. He's leading a, a, a revolution in that. And he's created technology that is now being exported to the world. And moreover, he's created an operation in Quebec to help uh, build his global market for this building technology and databases that help engineers and architects so a, a small illustration of what Canada can do, because Rafer has, says in the book, he's waiting to, 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 to help Canada. He's building a great business. He's helping China. Uh, he's a great entrepreneur. Uh, and Canada's missing a beat there because we're not working with the millions, as you say, uh, Canadians who are out there. You have dozens and dozens of examples in the book, and I can't even imagine the amount of research that went into writing this book. Um, and so there are two ways to look at all these success stories. One, of course, is to be proud, but the other, I think it's, a, it's to be, you know, it's a bit of a shame that their talent couldn't have stayed in Canada. How do you reconcile that tension? I, I, I argue in the book, we've got to think a lot more like Israel and Singapore and Why? not worry about geography. We've got this great Canadian population. Absolutely, it'd be great if someone like Rafer Wallace stayed in Canada, or James Cameron, the, uh, the, the great Hollywood film producer. But they can do just as much for Canada outside our borders as they do here, if we work with them. And that's where we're really falling short. Other countries like Israel and Singapore, but also India, Ireland, Italy, uh, there's scores of them that I, uh, that I go through in the book are working with their global populations because we live in increasingly a network age and the pandemic has accelerated this where networks are more powerful in many ways than institutions uh, we still need to to work with global institutions but we have to be much more network minded which is how the israelis and singaporeans think we've got these networks of canadians 
everywhere who can connect us with their networks and, uh, and, and, and so on. If you just look at the most powerful forces in the world this year, Black Lives Matter and what Greta Thunberg is, is building on, on climate change, those are networks. And that's the sort of thinking that we as Canadians can, can, can really advance in the 2020s. Can you give me, um, because in the book you do talk about what Ireland, Israel, India, um, Scotland are doing to leverage their expats. How can Canada, like, can you give us an example of how Canada, the Canadian government, can leverage their expats to advance the country itself? Well, first of all, we just have to recognize that we have this uh, 11th province. Uh, we don't have to formally make it a province, but but uh, recognize it and, and help the, 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 these groups of expats build their own networks wherever they are. I profile the example in the book of the C100, which is an amazing group of Canadians in Silicon Valley who 10 years ago decided Canada was losing the tech race and they wanted to help Canada help themselves as well. But they, they built this powerful network that has become a key advisor to the Harper government as well as the Trudeau government, which I think is important. This is a nonpartisan opportunity. They are helping bring Canadian entrepreneurs to Silicon Valley and then go back to Canada to build stronger, more globally focused companies. One of the first companies they helped is Shopify. So when we talk about how do we build 10 more Shopify's, one thing we have to do is work with the C100 work with Canadians in the Valley who can give us a leg up, who can give Canadian entrepreneurs a leg up. Take that thinking to Canadians in, 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 in London, in Dubai, in Shanghai, in Mumbai, help them help Canada in those uh, in those places. Um, you also write that Canadians have, uh, you write that Canada continues to show a boundless capacity for brain, uh, brain drain debate while the world focuses on brain circulation and brain trusts. What's the difference? It's understanding that people uh, go out, they come back, they go out, they come back. Some go out and they don't come back. Let's not fret too much about that. Sure, it's great if people gain global experience and bring it home. We need actually a lot more of that. But we also need Canadians out there who are staying out there who can take us into those global networks, help us trade more, invest more, build cultural linkages in different parts of the world to enhance Canada's presence in those, in those countries. One of the lessons from the United Nations Security Council debate is that Canada's place in the world is shrinking. That's just math. Our share of kind of everything is going to decline a little bit. So how do we offset that with the power of, uh, with the power of our networks? You uh, mentioned before that the expats, well, in the book, you refer to them as the 11th uh, province. Do, you know how, do we know how many people live abroad? No, we don't know. There's no census of, of, of this. So I, I, I work with a team. I, because can't, we're, we're almost shy about our uh, expats, and, and there's also privacy issues uh, that we need to be mindful of. Um, but, it, the, but this requires more focus from the federal government to say, how do we, and it's, it's not an intrusion, just keep a better map of where Canadians are in, in, in the world. Uh, I worked at it with a team of researchers at the Monk School at the University of Toronto. And we were able to put together uh, an interesting database uh, working with various censuses, not just the Canadian census, but censuses in other countries where they ask, what's your country of origin? So we were able to see how many people are identifying Canada as their country of origin and start to literally map out where the Canadians are. And that's how we were able to say with confidence, there's probably two to three million Canadians out there at any given time working, studying, living uh, outside our country for, uh, you know, more than uh, more than a short term visit. That's a big chunk. It's a, it's a big number. It, yeah. And, and it, it is something where we're underappreciating and we're, we're missing the opportunity to help them help Canada in a world that's going to be a little tougher, a little more challenging, but in a world that really, really values the strengths that Canadians can bring to different cultures, different markets, uh, different parts of the world. Why do some Canadians leave and choose to work abroad? It's a it's a, it's a great question. They, they, they there's a there's a real range, and it takes a, a, you know takes a, a lot of courage uh, and a certain mindset to leave a comfortable country and a, a country of one's uh, uh, of usually one's family and uh, kinship. 
they go for world opportunities they, to, to make it on the world stage. They go to get away from uh, certain aspects. They go for adventure. Uh, and then they stay because they love the opportunities that uh, are out there. If you are a, a, a physicist or a movie actor or, uh, or, or a poet, uh, sometimes you just want to be in different parts of uh, the world. That's okay. We're really good at bringing people to this part of the world. Uh, we need to be comfortable with Canadians going out to other parts of uh, the world. And as I say, many are going to stay. And that's, that's not a loss for our country if we don't let it be a loss, if we try to turn it into a gain. We know that a lot of uh, international students choose to make Canada their home after they finish their studies. But you argue that Canadian students should also study abroad. Why is that? Canada is getting really good at bringing uh, many of the world's best students to uh, to here, especially for post-secondary education. That's uh, that's an enormous strength and a growing strength for our colleges and universities and for our country and our economy. We need to add to that by getting Canadian students out into the world. We don't uh, Canadian students don't leave as easily as uh, foreign students come here for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, if you look at other countries like Australia, they have gotten really good at encouraging and, and incentivizing students to study abroad. When students go abroad, they, they, they learn differently, but they also develop those networks. Uh, I, I, I devote a chapter, spent some time with uh, some millennials in London uh, who had gone largely for school and they had stayed. And they, uh, you know, they might come back, they're still in their 20s, but what they really want to do is in their different pursuits, in their jobs in, in, in London or Oxford, is to connect back to Canada better. And that's the missing link that we, uh, we, we have an opportunity to, to correct. And you argue that that's where the government can be involved. When people do leave Canada, where do they go? So it's, uh, it, it, it's a fascinating shift. So the, the obvious centers, uh, Silicon Valley, L.A. for Hollywood, uh, New York and, and, and London. Hong Kong, as we know, but interestingly, there's a real growth in other centers like uh, Beirut, uh, Dubai, Delhi, and Mumbai, and 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 this is a really important opportunity for Canada because the children of the of immigrants who came here in the 80s and 90s, so millenn millennial second generation Canadians, are going out into the world in bigger in big numbers, and that is a real opportunity for for Canada. I met so many young Canadians whose parents had immigrated to Canada and they then had gone out into the world. One is a, a, a young woman named Yasmin Rafai who is whose parents are Iranian. She grew up in Edmonton. She went to Oxford and now she is at Stanford in medical school. Hmm. She's going to do some extraordinary things I think in the in the coming years and, and decades whether she stays out in the world or comes back to Canada or probably does both. Hmm. But Yasmin is kind of the, f the future. She is a children of different cultures, and that in a way is the story of Canada. And that is a great value out in the world, people who can speak to different cultures, who can bridge difference, something that Canadians were not perfect at, but were better at than many uh, uh, cultures. That's gonna be a growing strength for Canadians out in the world. It's gonna be our calling card but also our calling card for, for us as a country. Just to pick up on what you just said right now, I want to read something from the book. And you write, whether it's in business or diplomacy, the arts or aid work, Canadians who go abroad often find that they have a unique voice in the world. Some are raised to recognize it. Others need time in a foreign land to feel the tug of a greater purpose and the desire to give voice to it. They've gone abroad not just to pursue their own interests or ambitions. They're out there because they are Canadian and need to speak up for principles that feel Canadian. Um, just to pick up from that, you write that Canada has a unique voice in the world. How so? It, it comes down to mutual accommodation, uh, which is in a way our very nature. We're not perfect at it, as I said, but we are better than most, than most in accommodating difference, in building bridges between different perspectives, in being empathetic and being able to understand different perspectives. We kind of take that for granted a lot of the time here in Canada. That's incredibly rare out in the world. And I, I was fascinated to meet so many Canadians who had excelled in different organizations, risen to the top of those organizations, because that was a, a, something they had grown up with mm. here in Canada and felt very comfortable with. 
there's a senior executive. He's 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 now uh, moved on, but he, he was at Deutsche Bank, and at one point he was the number two person at Deutsche Bank. And he said he was the only person on the executive team who could bring the Japanese, the Germans, the Brits, and the Americans together and try to find common ground. <laughs> it takes a Canadian. Dominic Barton, uh, who I interviewed for the book, he's now our ambassador, Canada's ambassador to China, said that when he was uh, the global head of McKinsey, he always knew when he would go into a meeting who the Canadians were. Because he said they were the people who asked questions and listen to the answer. And then he said, well, actually the Dutch are also very good at that, so I had to listen for the accent. But I, I think that's a really important point for Canadians to understand. Again, we're not perfect, but we are better at this than many in the world, and the world really needs this. It's not just other countries, it's not just the United Nations, it, it, it's corporations, it's organizations around the world that are increasingly made up of people from different parts of the world who need these Canadians to bring those different cultures, those different perspectives together. Well, you're also right. Um, as a country, we have to work harder to create the glue that bind expats with each other and with Canada, especially on days other than July 1st. What did you mean by that? When you talk to Can uh, Canadians in many parts of the world, they, I mean, they love the Canada Day celebration. They love getting together at a pub to watch a hockey game or the Olympics. But they say, boy, is that all you see in us? You know, just as, as people who should come together for a toast on, on Canada Day, we, 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 we want to help the country 365 days of the year. And that's the mentality that so many other countries are, uh, are, are bringing to their expat communities. Of course, they have national days of celebration. Uh, they bring expats together when a, a leader is in, in, in town. But it's really working on all the other days with, uh, with these people who are usually at the top of their game in whatever they're doing and can bring do so much for Canada if we reach out to them uh, and allow them to take us to, uh, to new places, take us into new conversations, and also ask them what they think we should be doing. Because this is, this is also a big kind of miss for Canada. Uh, we're not reaching out to this population of you know, two million or so, <laughs> most of them incredibly accomplished people in whatever they're doing, and just saying, hey, we're struggling with this issue or, or this opportunity. What do you think we should be thinking about? Well, um, I think some people watching this might think that, you, you know, you leave Canada, you benefit from uh, public school education, you get to vote. Um, but you say in the book that you think that the expats should be giving more back to Canada. How can they do that? So there's diff di different opportunities, and, and to, as I get into some detail in the book, I mean, we need to rethink our approach to taxation, to benefits of uh, health care and uh, ed education for people and their children uh, who may enjoy Canadian citizenship uh, abroad. That's all, you know, there's no right or wrong approach to it, uh, but there are better approaches to it than what we've got now, so that, that will require some review. But we also need to bring these people back, literally as well as figuratively, to, to, to bring them into the Canadian debate about all the issues that we're, we're wrestling with in this country for a mo more global perspective, but a, a global perspective that is informed by a Canadian uh, experience. It's fascinating in the, uh, in, in the pandemic to come across all the Canadians around the world who are working on uh, the, the COVID vaccine, uh, for instance, who are, who are in health organizations in other countries. As I mentioned, the, the head of Johns Hopkins University, which is maybe the leading university in the, in, in the study of COVID, is uh, Canadian. One of the leading scientists at Oxford University uh, working on the vaccine project is Canadian. How do we bring them in to help us think through our own uh, our, our own approaches to the coronavirus, they would love to be part of that, uh, that conversation. Um, I've lived abroad, as have you, and I mentioned to you before we started taping that when I lived abroad, I think I became, um, I realized, I became a more proud to be a Canadian. Is there anything that Canadians that are living abroad can teach us as, about, uh, as a nation? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible what distance both in, uh, in, in, in miles and time teaches us all. And 
as you said, the, the, the Canadians out there really have had to come to grips with what it means to be Canadian. Uh, because they don't have uh, you know all all the all the geography around them, and simply asking them what does it mean to be Canadian uh, can help us understand what it means and what we should value as, uh, as as being Canadian. And the longer they're away, it's interesting. The more patriotic they seem to be, and it's it's not just nostalgia, although the, you know, nostalgia can be can be a force. I think they recognize the longer they're away truly what it means to be Canadian. I had a great conversation with one of Silicon Valley's most successful uh, entrepreneurs and investors, Chamath Kulapatia, who grew up in Ottawa, the son of uh, refugees, uh, lived on welfare often, the family did. Uh, and he was one of the early executives in Facebook. Um, he, he's now a, a leading force in global investment, has his own firm called Social Capital. And he said, the longer he's away, the more he appreciates the value of, of Canadian public schooling. He said, I am who I am in Silicon Valley because of the public school system in Ontario. And then he got to go to Waterloo as a co-op student and uh, on and on from, uh, from there. But he was only able to truly appreciate this when he was in Silicon Valley. John, thank you so much. That's all the time we have today. I think this is a great book for a lot of people to study, to figure out, to recognize how proud um, we should be as a nation. And the next time you talk to Alexa, you should know that the woman behind Alexa is a Canadian. So thank you so much, John. We appreciate your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Plenty of people from all corners of the world choose to come to Canada, but many Canadians also pick up and find a new path in foreign lands. What drives them and how do they come to view their homeland? Let's ask from furthest away in geography to nearest. In Oxford, UK, Jeremy Howick, director of the Oxford Empathy Program in the University of Oxford's Faculty of Philosophy. In Los Angeles, California, Kirsten Stewart, member of the Executive Committee at the World Economic Forum and head of their Future of Media, Sport and Entertainment platform. In Atlanta, Georgia, Andrea Bibbs, Senior Director, Diversity and Inclusion Strategy at Warner Media News and Sports. And here in Toronto, Nadia Theodore, Senior Vice President, Global Government and Industry Affairs at Maple Leaf Foods and a former Canadian diplomat. Hi, welcome to you all from all over around the world where you are. We're very excited to have you on the program. Hello. Great to be here. Hello. I want to ask all of you the first question, uh, but Jeremy, I'll start with you since you're the furthest away. You've all watched John, Stackhouse, uh, John Stackhouse's interview. What did you think of his analysis of how Canada can better utilize its expat population? Jeremy? Yeah, I think it's a great idea because there's a lot of untapped potential of Canadians who are quite expert at what they do, all the people you have on the panel here, who could contribute to what John calls, I think it's a great idea, an 11th province. And also I think that we become prouder to be Canadian when we go away because Canada is far from perfect. We can improve many things, but when you go away, you realize how much better it is at a lot of good things than many other countries. I want to pick up on what you just said. Um, when I lived abroad, I actually think I became a better Canadian. Why do you think we become prouder when we live abroad? Let me give an example. I went home back to Canada a, a few years ago and I had a barbecue with some friends, just random friends who I grew up with. We were sitting around the, around the table chatting and I realized of six, six people, there were three people born in countries outside Canada, three different religions. And it was just seamless and it was fine. It was not, it was, it was totally normal. But outside Canada, that kind of thing is not as normal as it should be. So that's why I think we're better at, you know, what John called the bridging differences and so on. So I think this 11th province idea would be great and we have a lot to offer. Uh, Kirsten, I want to ask you the first question I asked Jeremy. Um, you saw John Stackhouse's interview. How do you think Canada can better utilize its expat population? 
Well, I think, you know, as we've been, as we've been saying here already this morning, you know, we are connected. Uh, we do have a, a very kind of solid uh, shared set of values and it's easy for us to sometimes find each other overseas. And I think uh, it's a great idea to tap into that talent base. You know, this is the, this is the time of networks. Connected networks are so important. And I think the opportunity to really kind of leverage the power and the strength and the connectivity of ourselves as we are in different places around the world you know, that's something that's untapped and, and probably could be better utilized. And Andrea, you've been in Atlanta for almost 20 years, 20 years, almost 20, 20 years. I should know this. Uh, what how, what yeah. did you think of what John Stockhouse said? I, I thought it was great. Um, and I think especially that around that bridging differences and utilizing us as Canadians um, who are overseas to help better, uh, you know, Canada at home in many different ways. Um, so I, I really love that. I, I feel like just like what Jeremy was saying, I became an even pr prouder Canadian when I moved to Atlanta and to the U.S. So I'm always waving my flag and I feel like I'm an unofficial ambassador here. So just, you know, continuously talking about how great our country is and many opportunities um, for Americans and others to to utilize some of the great things we have at home as well. And Nadia, you recently moved back to Toronto after living in Atlanta. Um, so I'll ask you the same question. What do you think about his argument to utilize the expat population better? Yeah, you know, I think that the idea of using Canadians at all levels um, while they are abroad to better our home country is something that John and the book and this idea of Planet Canada is going to pay off for us exponentially over the next 5, 10, 15 years. And in particular, you know, what kind of drove it home for me was the idea of us not fretting so much about whether we are experiencing brain drain or brain gain, something that we always talk about when we talk about expats and Canadians going and living abroad. You know, oftentimes there's this fretting about Canadians leaving our country and then leaving the talent and expertise that they have with them. And I think that John's idea and the whole thesis that no, in fact, Canadians that go abroad, it is brain gain for Canada. Um, if we are intentional about reaching out and connecting, not just to the CEOs and heads of companies and heads of institutions that live abroad, but Canadians of all walks of life, all expertise at all levels of their careers that are abroad and drawing them into the future of Canada and the Canadian story that we are trying to create in our hometowns then in fact, what we are doing is building this 11th, this, this 13th province and territory, I'd like to say, you know, um, that can really um, benefit richly to our domestic experience, Canadian experience, but also this idea of our global Canadian experience and the global footprint that we want to leave as Canada. And just to pick up on what Nadia was saying, Kirsten, um, you know, when we do think when Canadians leave, uh, leave the country, we think of it maybe as a loss. Is, is, should we change how we look at that and look at it more as a, of a gain, as Nadia was suggesting? Absolutely. And I think this idea of, of a cycle, I think, you know, John points that out in the book around the fact that this is not about a brain drain or brain loss. This is a brain cycle and going out into the world and then coming back to Canada. I know myself, I've done that about three or four times. I've left the country, gone to find, you know, some great jobs to do internationally. I tend to always come back. And I think, you know, there hopefully is a benefit back to the country when people like myself decide that, you know, they've had a great experience overseas or in another country and, you know, have learned a lot and can bring some of that back to uh, the country, including those networks that we built internationally. Like, I think there is that sense of a brain cycle, which is so powerful. You said that you always come back. Is that because of family or is it because Canada is home? 
Canada is home. And yeah, I do have family here, but I also have family globally. And I think for so many of us, you know, I think the wonderful thing about Canada is we are a nation of largely immigrants. And so whether it's ourselves or our parents who have come to Canada, you know, we there is this sense of a, of a constant looking for, to globally. Like, I think we are, a glo I think we're global citizens. And there is this kind of home yeah, you know, there's a homebodiness about uh, what we what we experience as well, and I think sometimes we miss home when we're away from it. Uh, and as much as we can be proud of being, uh, you know, in in this world and be being global, there is something about coming home too. And I've always done it. Um, I'll be, be curious to see if I do it again this time. <laughs> and Andrea, I saw you nodding your head. Yeah, I mean, definitely, because I mean, so many of us are children of different cultures, as John said in his book as well. Um, you know, my parents are, they moved to Canada from the UK and both have Guyanese roots and I'm first generation Canadian. So I grew up with a lot of other first generation Canadians. And I think growing up, I probably felt a little bit more Guyanese than Canadian. And when I moved to the States, I think it was even more important for me to know, uh, to, to really shout that I'm Canadian. <laughs> and especially having small children, making sure that they know that they're as Canadian as they are American as well. So, um, you know, I think being a first generation Canadian also gives us the opportunity or, or gives us this different, um, I'd say we're maybe a little bit more empathetic to different cultures as well. And I think that helps us when we're in the U.S. and, and other places overseas. And Jeremy, um, was there anything in particular that John said that you strongly related to? Yeah, well, I think that he had a great idea to um, to mention the the C100, these tech geniuses in the Silicon Valley, who have banded together. They're all Canadian, and they they help Canadians in the Silicon Valley, and they they go back to Canada and help. There could be a you know, there's all this goodwill. People go away, they're away, they feel more Canadian. They want to help. We could have a kind of M100 for people in media and sports, like Christine and Andrea, and an F100 for people in food, and an H100 for people in health. I mean, here at Oxford alone, Professor Sir John Bell is leading the charge to get a vaccine for um, the coronavirus, and he's way up, way higher than, than I am, but I'm also not, not bad at what I do. So there's all this <laughs> opportunity and this goodwill. So being intentional about it, as Nadia said, it should be a pretty easy task that could pay huge dividends. Nadia, I mentioned that you just came back to Toronto and it was really nice to see the homecoming that you had on social media. A lot of people were very excited that you're back in the city and you're working for Maple Leaf Foods, uh, but you were Consul General for Canada in Atlanta. Is it much of what John is talking about, the actual job of Canada's diplomatic community? Absolutely. And, you know, more and more, it is our job to connect Canada around the world. More and more, we are seeing that our diplomats, our diplomatic community, uh, our foreign service can really help shape the future of Canada by encouraging Canadians, the diaspora around the globe, wherever we as diplomats are placed, to be drawn in, as John says, not just on Canada Day, uh, not just for the celebrations, but for the deep policy discussions that we are having about Canada domestically and Canada as our place in the world and where our place in the world is. And I think that we are, you know, over the past five to 10 years, I would say, the diplomatic community has really tried to focus in on making those connections, building those communities, building those relationships abroad with Canadians, again, at all rank, mm -hmm. <laughs> in all different sectors, to really get a cross-functional view of what our Canadians abroad see as the future of Canada and what their contribution can be while they are living abroad and then eventually when they come back home. And when you were in Atlanta as Consul General, what was your role? So as Consul General and as, as a Consul General, as an ambassador, or as a high commissioner, our senior diplomats abroad are really the voice and the face of Canada around the globe. 
And so, you know, our number one job, in fact, is to protect Canadians who are traveling in our regions of accreditation. That's number one. And we saw that ever so clearly and transparently during COVID-19 and the repatriation of so many Canadians from around the globe. And then second, of course, is our duty and our joy to help Canadian businesses who are looking for opportunities to sell their stuff, whether it's goods or services and everything in between around the world. And so we have teams uh, around the world. They're called, they're called trade commissioners. Find one, use one if you are a Canadian company looking to sell, sell abroad and go global. And then thirdly, and a bit about what we're talking about here today, we are here to sell the brand of Canada abroad, to really be the voice of Canada's foreign policy, the voice of Canada's pulse um, abroad, to tell people about what Canada stands for, what our values are, what our intentions are, uh, and to build those alliances with other countries and other communities around the world. So, Kirsten, uh, you know, when we hear Brand Canada, do you think that the engagement of Canadians abroad should largely be a job for diplomats, or does the private sector have a role that they can play? Oh, I think the private sector has a great role. And I think, you know, as already was pointed out, the C100, you know, there's a lot of communities that are already self-forming on the private side, if you want to call it that. And I think business leaders who get together, and I think, you know, Nadia makes a great point too. It's not just about leaders of business, but people who lead within businesses. So it's not always necessarily the top CEOs or presidents of companies, but those that take leadership positions on their own to kind of force their way through. There's entrepreneurs, there's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a huge network of Canadians that do find each other. And I think as much as, you know, we have the benefit of the diplomatic service in, in extending those opportunities to reach out and kind of talk about the greatness of Canada. I think it's, you know, it's 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 also a great opportunity to tap into those that are on the private side and working business day to day uh, to also, you know, be advocates and support the idea of Brand Canada, not just the ability of Canadians within Canada, but those that are global to connect and really, you know, bring forward some fantastic, you know, the, the, the wonderfulness of Canada. Well, you know, in the book, um, John said he had he had lots of um, examples for the argument that one of the reasons that people like Canadians around the world is because we're kind of like the U.S., but not really. Um, so, Jeremy, when you are living abroad, do you think that your country, do you think Canada celebrates your achievements the way they might if you were an American? I think the good thing about Canada is that we don't kind of brag about our, ourselves as much as some other countries like like our neighbors down south. And can I just add one thing to what Natty said? I agree that it's not just about Canada Day, but London's best party in Trafalgar Square used to be the Canada Day Parade, and for some reason they stopped doing it. And if they could re reinstate that, that would be be wonderful. Because I agree. It was a great place. I went when I lived in the UK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so and then what we've been good at, and I'm, I was happy that John mentioned it, the idea of soft power. You know, we don't. Yeah. At the end of the day, we're we're a small country, but because we're better, not perfect, but better at this making bridges, understanding differences, empathy, and so on, um, that gives us power to connect people. And in this increasingly interconnected world, there should be a there's a great role to play. And the fact that there are so many successful Canadians out there proves that so tapping into that power would be a great idea so yes i've i enjoy you're, you're proud to be canadian because people are right away positively inclined towards you the minute you say that you're canadian so it's a great advantage mm -hmm. being a canadian outside canada um i wanted to ask all of you how did you end up living where you are living jeremy i'll start with you yeah, well, the best supervisor for my PhD topic was at the London School of Economics. So I went there and then I got a job at Oxford, which was kind of a, for me, a dream job. And then I was thinking about coming back to Canada. But a few years ago, I met the woman who's my wife now. We have two kids and her parents live here and she doesn't want to move back to Canada. <laughs> That's great. So. My husband's from the UK. <laughs> I made him move back to Canada. <laughs> well, after you five years there. <laughs> you have better negotiating skills than I do. <laughs> and Kirsten, how did you end up in L.A.? 
so I'm in LA. My husband's actually consul general here in uh, Los Angeles, Arizona, and Nevada. And uh, I, with the World Economic Forum, so I was working in Geneva for the last year, had moved to the New York office. And then when suddenly everything started shutting down, um, instead of commuting back and forth from New York to LA to uh, see my husband, uh, we decided I'd be working from here, working from home out of out of LA. But this is my, as I said before, this is my, I think my third stint now in the States. I've, when I was with Twitter, I was um, running the North American media business out of New York. I was with Hallmark running the international channels out of Denver. So I've had a few experiences in the States and, you know, it's ultimately, you know, we talked about why, um, sometimes it doesn't matter scale, mm -hmm. like as much as we love and, you know, enjoy and we can, you know, nurture ourselves and really learn and grow within Canada. Sometimes you do have to extend outside those borders in order to really kind of you know, live the full experience of your possible career. And I think that's why a lot of folks do end up going. Uh, and again, that's not necessarily brain drain. That's part of a cycle. You, you know, hopefully you come back again, but this is now my third time in the state. It, it, does it feel kind of um, weird or strange in this COVID time? I know you said you've had family here, you have family there as well, but yeah. not being able to know when you, would, you will be able to see your family in Canada. It's really tough. Um, yeah, I've got my girls who are grown, more grown now. One's out of, one's out of university. Uh, the other one just graduated actually into this kind of bad mess right now. Um, my parents are there, uh, but most of my family's back in the UK as well. And, you know, I think we've been used to living a connected life. I think uh, challenges like this, COVID times make it really, really tough. Uh, I feel a bit better, to be honest with you, knowing that they're back in Canada. I feel like they're a bit safer where they are uh, than if they were with me necessarily. So, you know, and I know that, the, you know, the challenge of COVID is everywhere and, you know, the case ri cases are rising globally, which is, you know, very scary for everybody involved. But I think there is a sense of comfort in knowing that with the Canadian healthcare system, they're sitting in Canada and probably are pretty safe compared to where they could be elsewhere. Um, you know, it's, it's been great being able to continue doing this show, but sometimes the tech is not uh, with us. And so Andrea, we've lost Andrea Bibbs. We're trying to reconnect with her. But in the meantime, we'll continue our conversation. Uh, Nadia, how did you end up living abroad? Well, so I went abroad for, for my job. My previous uh, life, career life, was all about representing Canada in different places around the globe. Um, you know, and to Kirsten's point about cycles, my decision to, in this time, come back to Canada um, and move to Toronto, I'm born and raised in Ottawa, but to move to Toronto and to take up uh, an, an executive role with Maple Leaf Foods was really about exactly what we're talking about. This idea of expats, Canadians who have lived the majority or, or a vast majority of their life abroad, seeing what the opportunity is to give back to their country, taking what they have learned and then coming home to make that contribution. And who knows, maybe, you know, one day continuing that cycle, as Kirsten said, and going back out. But for me, it was the opportunity to work for such an iconic Canadian brand with such strong values that aligned with my own, seeing what I had seen living abroad and having the opportunity now to give back to Canada from home um, was something that I just couldn't pass up. Was it bittersweet for you to come back um, because you you had a community in Atlanta, you had friends, you had people, your friends. Was it bittersweet to come back? Absolutely. It was. It was bittersweet to come back. It was bittersweet to leave government and, and join the private sector, all of those things. Um, and, you know, I think it's a little bit about what we're talking about when we talk about Planet Canada and the cycle of people coming in and out. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely bittersweet to leave your country for another opportunity. Um, but of course, then when the decision is, is made to then come back home, it's also bittersweet to leave the life that you have created abroad. Um, but, you know, I, I really like this idea of calling it a cycle. Mm. I think that um, that is true with so many things in life and, and for sure it's true with regards to careers. And, um, you know, bit, bittersweet to leave, but 
it sure does feel good to be home. Uh, and, <laughs> well, welcome back. Uh, Jeremy, I lived in the UK for five years, as I mentioned, and uh, a lot of people would have mistaken me for being American. And I don't know why I would get offended. I would say, um, no, I am Canadian. Do you find, do you, have you gone through that? And do you correct people? Yes, well, the fact is that, I mean, the United States is more belligerent internationally than Canada is. So um, in, in many countries, it's dangerous to be an American. So we're quite happy to be identified as Canadians. Mm. And when I've traveled around, around the world, a lot of Americans put Canadian flags on their backpacks. And just listening to all these wonderful stories, I, I also went away twice. I went to the university, my undergraduate degree in the States. And in a way, you know, it's not a brain drain, it's a brain gain because we, we go away, we expand our own horizons as, as Canadians. And we therefore have maybe even more to give back when we've been away and when we are away. So, yes, but overall, I'm proud to be Canadian. I do correct people, but I don't get angry like some Canadians do because um, the fact is that our accents to the outsiders are difficult to distinguish. Well, well how would you define the difference between Americans and Canadians? Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, Americans are just like Canadians, but a, a bit more. So we're, we're, our culture is, to a large degree, not to all, not to not in every sense, but mm -hmm. shared in many ways. The backgrounds are shared. Both countries are multicultural, but the U.S. has a more violent background, has a more violent culture. Um, they're more likely to use guns, more likely to be a bit less um, uh, knowledgeable about the rest of the world. They're more likely to be um, a bit less able to uh, make bridges. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I, I'm not uh, generalizing for any American friends watching that they're, they're bad people. It's just the fact is that there are differences. And anyone who's been to both countries notices it. And I think it's just we're just a bit more tempered in many important and good ways. And Kirsten, um, given that you're living in the U.S., um, does that bother you when you're mistaken for being an American? No, no. And, and in the end, they kind of say, well, yeah, now I kind of hear it in your accent. Mm -hmm. And they do they do kind of place me as Canadian after I reveal myself. And gosh, you know, I'm constantly wearing Raptors t-shirts and, and <laughs> I pretty much identify myself as a we the North kind of person all the time. So I think I make, I make it pretty clear. But, you know, going, going to what Jeremy said around, you know, the, the difference in how we kind of act and behave. And I think, you know, it's just our general experience. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about leaving Canada because of the necessity to grow a career with scale and perhaps coming to the States is a part of that. But it also, the, what we've learned in Canada and the way that we kind of grow ourselves in our jobs and our roles is as because of our lack of scale maybe is the is we we become generalists like we in the states i find mm -hmm. they like to hire canadians because we have a broader view not just of the world because you know culturally we do tend to travel more and and everything else that jeremy was talking about but also just in our roles in our in our careers we've developed a a, a certain kind of expertise that's that uh, that can make us more kind of flexible in multiple roles and so at times like these especially when they're looking for you know how are we going to get ourselves out of this post-covid recession and what does that look like and how are we going to rebuild things having generalists like ourselves who have been really responsible and have to be quite flexible in our jobs because there's no such thing as you know we don't have the scale to support someone doing something so specific uh, that our our ability to work across departments to work across industries you know i think that's something that is a real value and I find that when I get hired as a Canadian in the States it's always pointed to the fact that you, know, you can do more than one job and I think that's you know a great skill to have. Um, and Nadia because um, I, I think people when we do talk about the opportunities Canada has its challenges we know that but I think people would be surprised to know that especially this past summer we were talking about uh, racial injustice the Black Lives Matter movement I know a lot of my friends uh, who are black, people of color, who have chosen to go to the, to the United States because there are more opportunities there for them. Would that surprise people, Nadia, do you think? You know, I think that it might surprise Americans, frankly, when they hear that Canadians have left Canada to go to the United States because there is a lack of opportunity in Canada. Um, I think that many Americans um, see 
the differences between Canada and, and the United States, much like how Jeremy described it. Uh, and so they, you know, they would often say to me, wow, you live in the best country in the world, or at least the second best country in the world after, after <laughs> their own, because they are very patriotic. Um, and they would be surprised to hear that in many sectors, and especially when we're talking about corporate Canada, much of the time gaining opportunities as 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 we've talked about to really scale your career is quite diff difficult in Canada and that's you know by virtue of the size of, of, of our economy um, but also by virtue of you know the 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 cultural norms that is Canada you know which of course in some instances are positives not being too much not being too extra, not wanting too much, not wanting to be too boastful. All of those things are positives in many instances. But when you're looking to grow a career um, and, and get those, those endorsements and, and those opportunities, um, you know, oftentimes you want people who are going to be boastful about you, um, who are going to push you to want more and do more and gain more. And, and so that requires you oftentimes to go abroad. And I think that many Americans would be surprised that that is the truth that many Canadians feel um, um, when, they, when they stay in Canada. One of the arguments that John makes in the book is that, you know, while we do have a lot of international students coming to Canada to study here, one of the arguments that he makes is that Canadian students should also leave Canada, travel abroad. And I understand um, there is a certain amount of privilege to be able to do that. Not everybody has access to funds or even a different passport to go and travel. Um, Jeremy, since you are in the UK and an academic, what do you think Canadian students would get by studying? abroad the main thing you get is that you realize how great Canada is because you get to contrast it with where you are so here in the UK it's a fantastic place but they have the vestiges of and a real class system and of course we have that in Canada too but the fact is that many people here in the UK who are part of the so-called upper class are unable to communicate with and relate to those they consider to be part of the lower class and that that creates problems it creates problems dealing with covid um, when you have the people in the government behaving in certain ways that um, the, the average Canadian politician just wouldn't 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 do so the, the benefit of going away is you realize what it is to be Canadian more so than you do paradoxically if you remain in Canada there's so many, so many things we take for granted like I mean you have a, the Brexit here was kind of a ha almost half half of the one percent difference. People kind of still it's paralyzing the country. Whereas in I'm from Montreal, we had a referendum there. It was the same thing, one percent difference. But the the next day, almost people, the vast majority of people just get on with it and accept the result. And whereas in the U.S., who knows what's going to happen if it's a one percent difference in this um, coming election. And Kirsten, you know, we can't um, have this conversation and not talk about what's happening in the U.S. Uh, the election is days away. What's it been like for you as a Canadian to watch an election of this magnitude unfold during a global pandemic as a Canadian living in the United States? You know, it, it is fa it's a fascinating time. I think we're here while history is being made, you know, in, in whatever way it gets made over the next week. You know, we're we're seeing conversations that have never been had before. We're seeing groups that had felt that they were disenfranchised and were for many reasons didn't have the microphone now have the microphone in a really powerful way. So it's just been, you know, as an observer, as someone who can't actually vote in this election, um, but who obviously has a lot of opinions because, you know, I live and, and work here. It's been an interesting it's been an interesting time, and I think we are really here at a time when history is going to be made, uh, and and to see how this all unfolds is going to be a fascinating next week ahead. And Nadia, I, I have to bring up your old job again. Um, when you were Council General, uh, you were responsible for some very Republican regions in the U.S. What was it like to work within a diplomatic context with Republicans? You know, I get asked that question all of the time, and I feel like my 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 answer is not um, what people are expecting. But uh, you know, I, I have to say that, uh, and maybe this is by virtue of my my training um, and by virtue of my personality. Mm. But it was good. Um, I found it 
to be one of the most absolutely difficult, um, but most rewarding and challenging parts of my job and challenging in a good way. Because for me, one of my core values mm. is talking to people who you may or may not disagree with, agree with, right? And, and connecting with people whose worldviews might be different than yours. Because to me, it's only through doing that that I can then identify, again, I always said to people, and you know, I'm stealing actually a line from Deputy Prime Minister Freeland. Um, she always used to say, you know, I get paid by Canadian taxpayers in Canadian dollars. Um, so my job is to think about Canada, right? Um, so, you know, it's only through talking to people who on the face of it have different um, views than I do that I can really start to unpack, okay, what is it that relates to what I am trying to bring back to Canada in this situation? You know, what is this person teaching me about where Canada can see itself? We, we always say, you know, when, when the U.S. sneezes, Canada catches a cold. Mm -hmm. And so the <laughs> upheaval that people are seeing in, the, in America today um, and this tension and this point in time in history, I really do believe that Canadians, especially Canadians that are living abroad, need to be watching and listening and learning and then bringing those learnings back home mm -hmm. for us to learn and to do better here at home to ensure that what we have built as a country is kept intact and ameliorated to the extent possible. And to me, my time in the Southeast USA taught me that in spades. And I learned so much from every member of Congress um, and politician and business person that I engaged in, no matter what the stripe. Well, I'll let, I think we can only finish off on that, Nadia. Thank you so much. And thank you to Kirsten and to Jeremy. And unfortunately, we weren't able to reconnect with Andrea. Uh, Andrea, we do appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is the agenda for Tuesday, October 27th, 2020. Case counts keep rising. Tomorrow, how well has the province done communicating with the public about COVID-19 during this pandemic? I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO. For joining us online at tvo.org. And Steve, we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.